Hello everyone and welcome to a review video for the Math 123 midterm. I have chosen a group of problems that are a little bit more challenging that should help you go over some of the key facts that we've learned during these first couple of weeks of Math 123. If you have any questions after the video is over, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to explain anything in further detail uh, through an email or through a live chat with you. So the first problem we're gonna look at is simplifying an expression and rewriting it with positive terms only. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here, and you might wonder, where do I even begin? So my preference, and there's a couple of different ways you could do this, but my preference would be to first tackle the denominator of the first fraction. The numerator is kind of done already. There's really nothing there that we could do. But on the bottom, I see this power of one third that needs to go to every term. So we want to remember that with a the, with the coefficient like 27, we're taking the third root of 27. It's not 27 times a third, but instead we have to think what number multiplied by itself three times will get us to 27. And that's equal to three. But when it comes to the exponents, like the negative four and the three that we see, those actually get multiplied. That's an exponent rule that we have to follow. So we have negative four thirds there and then just y to the first there. For the second group, we see that we have an exponent of negative one. That means anytime we have a negative exponent, we wanna just flip the fraction and then apply the exponent that's left. But with negative one, it's just really um, just flipping the fraction over. So the 32x to the seventh will go to the bottom. And then I'm gonna rewrite radical y as y to the one half. Um, those are the same thing. Remember that a radical really has a, an exponent of one inside and then the um, index is really two. We don't write it, but, the, but that's what it really is. So just get used to rewriting radicals like that. It'll save, um, it'll save a headache in the long run. So I probably start with that first. And then you really have two options from here. You can start like cross dividing things out or you can put everything together and simplify it. It's really up to you. So what I find kind of convenient is I see that eight and 32 go into each other. So eight goes into 32 or as a factor of 32 four times. So I'm just going to trim those numbers down. And then the same with the three and the nine, three and nine are three is a factor of nine and three goes into nine three times. So if I wanted to get that part of the problem out of the way, I can get the division done and just have three fourths as my coefficient with just dividing uh, among the top and the bottom. And you're allowed to go from one fraction to another, it just has to be one top and one bottom. You could do top left and bottom right, or you know any any top and any bottom is really fine. So take advantage of of that kind of work. And then with the variables, you know there, there's there's quite a few of them. So my move might be to work on the top first. So I have x squared, and then I have this y to the fourth and y to the half. That adds up to uh, four and a half, which is nine over two. And then on the bottom, I have x to the negative four thirds, x to the seventh. So if I add those up, um, seven is really uh, 21 over three. So my exponent on the x is going to be uh, 17 over three. That's kind of annoying. And the y will be by itself over here. So we start with that. And then the final step, you know, the three fourths is done already. And then in terms of x and y, because we want positive exponents only, like the direction said, we want to do the larger minus the smaller. So in the case of the x's, this uh, 17 thirds is bigger than 2. Just, just think like 3 goes into 17 almost 6 times. So that would be the larger of the two exponents. So we want to quickly just subtract um, 17 over 3 minus 2. And um, 2 is really 6 over 3. So if I rewrite it like that, my power of x is 11 thirds. And then with the y's, I have 9 over 2 on the top and 1 on the bottom. So if I subtract 9 over 2 by 1, that's really the same as 9 over 2 minus 2 over 2, which is uh, y to the 7 over 2. So this would be considered a completely simplified answer for the problem where we have positive exponents only. When it comes to dividing and multiplying fractions and simplifying, the move here that you want to make is to factor and cancel. We want to look for things that show up on both the top and the bottom and divide them out to create, you know, a one that we can simplify down. 
the only thing with division is that we have to uh, flip the second fraction when, when we're dividing any fractions, whether they're polynomials or fractions with integers in them, we always want to leave the first fraction alone and treat it as uh, multiplying by the inverse. So I'm just going to switch it to the uh, to the inverse or the reciprocal. And then once I do that, it just becomes a big factoring problem. We want to factor and determine what we can cancel out as being common factors. And my own opinion on this is to just start with the easiest one and then go from there. Things should things should cancel out. So if I had to choose, I think that's the easiest one of the four. So I would first look for two numbers that multiply to negative eight and add to negative six. And I don't know. Oh, positive eight. Sorry, I was going to say, I don't think anything does. Uh, that's a plus eight. So if I factor it, sorry about that. So if I factor it, two numbers that multiply to eight and add to negative six would be um, negative four and negative two. So I start with that. And the reason I started there is because it was simple, right? I don't have to worry about the coefficient of three or five. And with these problems, the goal is usually cancellation. So there's a pretty good chance that one of these two, or maybe even both, will show up on the top someplace. So if I'm guessing and checking, I could look at what's on the bottom and use that to guide my my thought process. So I just use that, you know, as like a hack to, to factoring, but you don't, you don't have to. It's just uh it's just an idea. So next I look at some of these other things. On the top I have this 5x squared plus 2x plus 3. That ends with negative 3, so I'm not going to use a 2 or a 4. Maybe this though, right? This 3x squared minus 2x minus 8. Perhaps uh, one of these two things goes um, into that as a factor. So with 3x squared, I would definitely need 3x and x. And then I'm looking for uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 8. And at the same time, when I do the outer and the inner, that it would add up to negative 2x. So I think a good move might be to try these, you know, one of these two factors. And I think what should work is if I do minus two here and plus four here, um, that'll give me negative six X plus four X. That's negative two X. So that that works. And, and that kind of uses my hint because now I, I found common factors that cancel. So just a little tip. So I did those two and then now maybe I'll, I'll tackle the bottom here. Five X squared minus 33 X plus 18. Um, with five X squared, um, the, oh, that should, this one should have been over here. It's fine. I'll, I'll put that, I'll move it over. So that, that what I just factored, I factored three X squared minus two X minus eight. That really belongs over here, but it honestly doesn't matter. Multiplication is commutative. So as long as it stays on top, it's good. But uh, for five X squared minus 33 X plus 18, five X squared only happens one way. So that definitely is, is five X and X. And then with the 18, I need two numbers that multiply to 18, but then at the same time, the outer and the inner have to add up to negative 33. So I think the move here would be negative six and negative three. So that I would have negative 30 X on the outer and negative three X on the inner. That adds up to the negative uh, 33 that I need. Don't see any cancellation yet, but not to worry. We do have to just do this last uh, polynomial. And the good thing about the last one is that there's a good chance that their factors are already there. So with 5x squared plus 2x minus 3, I know I definitely need 5x and x. And in looking at what's left over, this seems like, you know, maybe that's something I want to try to see if it works. And then um, to get the negative 3 out, I would need a plus 1 to, to get a product of negative 3. And if I check it, the outer is 5x, the inner is negative 3x, that adds up to the required 2x. So then the 5x minus 3s cancel out also. So I was a bit of a mess doing this. You know, I, I was kind of all over the place factoring things, but I think it's good to start easy and then look for common factors or use what's there to help you factor. So by using the 5x minus 3, I cut down on my guessing time because I thought something would have to cancel and it worked on the first try rather than just guessing blindly and trying a whole bunch of scenarios. So in the end, the only things I did not cross out were 3x plus 4, x plus 1, x minus 6, and x minus 4. So this would be a completely simplified 
fraction where I can't cross anything else out. It would be incorrect to cross out an X from a sum or a difference. That is not allowed. You have to keep terms completely intact if there's a plus or minus separating the terms. Similarly, when we're solving rational equations, remember here, this also involves factoring. Before you do anything, it's good to try to figure out what the least common denominator is. In this problem, if I factor the x squared minus 9, what I quickly realize is that the LCD is x plus 3, x minus 3. So I'm going to multiply every fraction on the top by x plus 3, x minus 3. And the effect of that is all the denominators will cancel because all of the denominators are factors of that LCD. For example, x minus 3 would cancel here. So I'd be left with 2x, x plus 3. And then x plus 3 is a factor here. So I'd be left with 5 times x minus 3. And then on the last one, it, everything cancels. The bottom matches the LCD. So I'd be left with just negative 27. Um, before I go much further, let's also point out that if I get out an answer of 3 or negative 3, that would not be allowed because those are the two values that make the denominator zero. We can never have an answer that results in a zero denominator. That would mean the fraction's undefined. So we continue by distributing 2x squared plus 6x and then 5x minus 15. And um, that adds up to 2x squared plus 11x minus 15 equals negative 27. And the way we solve a problem like this is we add 27 on both sides so that we're setting the, the polynomial equal to zero. That allows us to use proper the zero product property and uh, be able to factor and, and cancel from there. So that's just adding 27 here and adding 27 here. And then finally, to factor it, 2x squared is 2x and x. And 12 is, uh, we, there, it could be 6 and 2, 4 and 3, 12 and 1. But to get out the 11 in the middle, if I try a 4 here and a 3 here, that'll give me 8x on the outer and 3x on the inner. So I think that's the move we want to make. And then we set each factor equal to 0. And that gives me out x equals negative 3 over 2 and x equals negative 4. Neither of these are bad answers. We don't want to get out 3 or negative 3. So the fact that we didn't is good. We don't need to worry. If you want to, you can certainly plug them in to check to see if you get out the same thing on both sides. But we want to make sure we don't suggest an extraneous answer as an answer to the problem. Finding domain. Um, this is a very important skill you'll need for any math class you take. Domain helps us to understand where a function is defined and where it's not. Now, for this problem, uh, radical 2x squared minus 5x minus 3, we want to remember that when it comes to radicals, the domain of any radical function is that um, the inside is not negative, or in other words, that it is greater than or equal to 0. And to solve this type of problem, it's a polynomial inequality. We want to factor the polynomial that we have, again, using guess and check. Luckily, we have all prime numbers, so it should be pretty straightforward. 2x squared is 2x and x. Um, the 3 would be 3 and 1. We just have to place it so that it adds up to negative 5. So I think that move might be a, a 1 first and a 3 so that I can get negative 6 on the outer and 1 on the inner. And then once you have that, you make your number line with the two zeros. I have a zero of x equals 3 and a zero of x equals negative 1 half. And if you plug in values more than 3 into this polynomial, like let's say 4 or 5, you'll get out two positives. So that is good. That's part of the domain. If I plug in something between negative half and 3, like say 0, that'll give me out a negative. That's not what we want. And that's what you see here on this. Like I graphed it on Desmos just to kind of show you. Um, there, there's no function happening here. Nothing's defined between negative half and three because we're going negative. We can't take the square root of a negative. But then once we go to the left of negative half, say, you know, negative one, if I put negative one in, I would have um, negative one times negative four, which is a positive amount. And positives are good. 
So we are good to the left of negative half and to the right of three. So we would say the domain, you know, where we have those plus signs looks something like this in interval notation. And I just graphed just to show you that it's correct and, and to help you to understand how the math translates into a graph. You know, I think sometimes you get lost in the steps and the process and the factoring, but it really has a meaning in the plane that we're working with um, graphs and seeing where um, the graph is positive. Finding intercepts, remember we spoke about this in lecture, finding an x-intercept means letting y equal to zero and finding a y-intercept is when you let x equal zero. I think the y-intercept is the easier one. So if I go ahead and let x equal zero in this problem, I will have um, zero minus nine, zero plus zero minus 10. So this just works out to um, negative nine times negative 10 which is 90. So I would say that as a point, my y-intercept is 0, 90. For the x-intercept, letting y equal 0, that's a little bit more involved. So now I have to solve this equation out using um, methods such as factoring. I feel like factoring has been in every question so far, so it's an important skill. Um, x squared minus 9, that is x plus 3, x minus 3. And then x squared plus 3, x minus 10 that factors into x plus 5, x minus 2. And at the end, we just want to set every factor equal to 0. And we get out four answers. We get out negative 3, 0. We get out 3, 0. We get out negative 5, 0. And 2, 0. It's important when we write out uh, intercepts that we treat them as points and write which coordinate is 0. So if I'm finding a y-intercept, it's the x at 0. That's a, you know, and there's only one y-intercept per graph. I should mention that too. There's not going to be multiple or else it won't be a function. And then for x-intercepts, sky's the limit. Depends on the degree. All right, two more problems. So um, for a rational function, let's deconstruct it to find everything that we need. Vertical asymptotes come from the denominator. We set the denominator equal to zero. Um, I think a good practice with any rational function is to just factor everything right off the bat. That'll reveal a lot of good information. So I'm gonna factor the top and I'm gonna to factor the bottom using guess and check. Um, I need nine in the middle, but five at the end. So if I put a five here, that's 10. If I put a one here, I could work with 10 and one to get nine. So I could do a plus 10 and a minus one. Um, so one thing we want to, to note is that um, I see a common factor here of x plus 5. This is called a removable discontinuity. This means that there's a hole in the graph, and there's a hole where the discontinuity equals 0, or, or the common factor equals 0. So that would happen at x equals negative 5. Now, for the y value for a removable discontinuity, you put negative 5 back in, whoops, not a comma, you put negative 5 back in, to the simplified version. So you basically cancel out the x plus five as a whole, but then you plug it into what's remaining and that gives you negative 10 over negative 11, which is 10 elevenths. That would be the y coordinate that corresponds to um, where the removable discontinuity exists. So that's the first part. I think it's good we did that because with vertical asymptotes, um, that is where the denominator equals zero provided it's not already classified as a removable discontinuity. So for, for part A, we would just be setting the 2x minus 1 equal to 0. You don't want to call um, x equals negative 5 a vertical asymptote because it's not. It's a whole. So be sure when you write the vertical to also write x equals. A common mistake is students will just write the half or the value, but that is vague. Like it could be a, a point. It could be... An x coordinate, a y coordinate, we really don't know what it means. So when we're writing out asymptotes, you must write either x equals or y equals, depending on the situation. For horizontal asymptotes, we are looking at ratio. So we look at the highest degree on the top versus the highest degree on the bottom. So I have 1x squared versus uh, 2x squared. And that ratio is 1 to 2. So we would say that the horizontal asymptote is y equals one half. 
And this is used when the degrees are the same. So we had an X squared on the top is the highest power and an X squared on the bottom. If the bottom highest power was larger than the top highest power, Y equals zero would be the default asymptote. But if they're the same, then we just use the ratio of the coefficients. Last, X and Y intercepts. So for an X intercept, we are setting the top equal to zero. Um, we only had X minus five left over. The X plus five had canceled out. So the X, only X intercept we will get is um, five comma zero. So for X intercept, you set the numerator equal to zero. For the Y intercept, you let X equal zero and solve. So if I, if I, plug zero into what's remaining, x minus five over two x minus one, I get out um, zero minus five over zero minus one, that's equal to five. So my y intercept would be zero five. So lots of stuff here, x intercept five zero, y intercept zero five, horizontal option two, y equals a half, um, vertical option two, x equals a half, and then removal discontinuity at this weird point right here. So this is the type of work and analysis you would need to do on a rational graph before you go ahead to graph it. All right, last problem is on um, logs. So we're going to take a look at simplifying down a log into um, a couple of terms, if we can. So notice here that we have all logs with base of 5. and we can use properties to make this a little bit simpler. Instead of having four logs, we can hopefully trim it down to just one log. And there's a log rule that's going to help uh, guide us through this process. If we have log of A minus log of B, we can rewrite this as log of A over B. Basically, a difference of logs equals a log of a quotient. And that's connected back to um, properties of exponents. When, when we have a, a, a quotient of exponents, we subtract the powers to simplify. But when we're subtracting logs, we make a quotient of the inside. Um, the short story is here, just to keep it really simple, the 84 is the very first thing. So that's going to be in the numerator, just like the A is here. Anything at all that follows a negative sign automatically goes to the denominator. So I'm going to have 15 in the denominator. I'm going to have 7 thirds in the denominator. And I'm going to have 1 over 60 in the denominator. Because anytime I have, oh, sorry, that's a plus. So that actually goes in the numerator. My bad. I need glasses. Um, so the the one over 60, that's a plus. So that's going to go in the numerator. This is going to go in the numerator. Any positive log goes in the numerator and any negative log goes in the denominator. It's just easier to explain it that way than to agonize over the steps. So I'm just going to place one over 60 up here. And then, I mean, it's really your choice on how you want to do this um you know we, we can simplify it a variety of ways um what might be helpful is like i'm just thinking out loud here i would personally like to move this up to the top because we're dividing you know when you're dividing by a fraction it ends up being multiplied by the reciprocal and then the 60 because that's in the in the denominator that can just go to the denominator of the fraction i think this would be a lot easier to work with. Oh, and the seven's down here too. I can't forget about the seven. And then once we have that, we could try to clean this up. So method one would be to either like make a fraction out of this and then narrow it down, or we can just start simplifying and, and chipping away at these big numbers. So without a calculator, my game plan would probably be seven is a factor of 84, 12 times. Three is a factor of 15, five times. 12 is a factor of 65 times. So it looks like what I really only have, like when I narrow it down, I really only have one over five times five. I was able to find common factors among all these terms. So what, what's really left is log base five of one over five squared. And I could rewrite one over five squared as five to the negative two. That'll help me get an answer quickly because Recall that if the base of the log matches the base of the exponent, that's the inverse situation. So I'm just left with negative two. Or another way you could think of it is 
the negative two um, comes down using the log law and then log base five of five is equal to one because that question is what power of five is five? And that's just one. So a couple of different ways to do it. These problems were a little bit more challenging than what you'll probably get, but I wanted to review above the content so that you can think a little bit more critically and have a really good understanding of, of why and how we solve some of these problems. So as you're reviewing, please go over your all to set, the classwork worksheets, and then I downloaded a whole bunch of review problems too with answers, lots of resources available for you to check out. Good luck preparing for your midterm.